Welcome to Statics. Friction continued. I begin by focusing on friction force direction. I will look at a few examples. Suppose that we have a rock on an inclined plane, and we want to find the minimum applied force to prevent sliding. Here is my free body diagram with the applied force, the self-weight, and the normal force shown. In which direction does the friction force act? To determine this, I consider the direction of motion or impending motion of the rock. We are looking for the minimum force to keep the rock from sliding down the incline. So our friction force points in the direction opposite of the impending motion of the rock, up the incline. Note that the static friction helps to reduce the applied force because it is acting in the same direction as the applied force. Let's consider an alternative scenario. Suppose that I want to find the force required to slide the rock up the incline. Again, here's my free body diagram. Which direction is the friction force oriented? Because we are now trying to slide the rock up the incline, the impending motion is up, so our friction force is oriented in the opposite direction, pointing down the incline. Note that in this scenario, the applied force must overcome the static friction since they are opposing each other. So it takes more force to slide the rock up the incline than it does to prevent the rock from sliding down the incline. So the key thing to note is that the friction force acts in a direction to oppose motion or impending motion. Let's consider a different type of friction problem. Suppose that we have a rod supported on a horizontal surface at one end and a vertical surface at the other. If there is impending motion at one of the contact points, then there is also impending motion at the other contact point. Here is a free body diagram showing the self-weight and the normal forces at both supports. We will have friction forces at both contact points. Which directions are they oriented? The rule is that the friction force acts in a direction to oppose motion or impending motion. If this rod is going to slip under its own weight, point A contact will move to the left, and point B contact will move downward. So I show the friction force at A pointing in the opposite direction, to the right, and the friction force at B pointing upward. In this example, we have a two-member truss that is only stable if the surface is sufficiently rough at both points A and C. If there is impending sliding, it will occur at A or C, but not at both simultaneously. So we will have impending motion at some points of contact. Here is a free body diagram of the complete structure. I need to include friction forces at both contact points. In which directions are the friction forces oriented? Again, here is the rule. They are directed to oppose motion. If point A slides, it will move to the left. If point C slides, it will move to the right. So I show the friction forces acting in the opposite directions. Let's consider a final example. Suppose that we have a wheel supported by smooth journal bearings with an offset weight creating a tendency for the wheel to rotate. Bar ABD acts as a brake with a pin support at D and an applied force at A. Suppose we want to find the minimum force P that prevents the wheel from rotating. We will analyze this problem with two rigid body, free body diagrams. The first is the wheel. I show the moment caused by the weight on the cable times radius R1. I also show the support reactions at C and the normal force. Note the direction of the normal force is perpendicular to bar ABD and represents the push of the bar on the wheel. The friction force will act perpendicular to the normal force and tangent to the surface of the wheel. It will also act in a direction to oppose impending motion of the wheel. The moment on the wheel is causing it to want to rotate counterclockwise, so the friction force must point to the right to oppose the rotation. Next, I draw the free body diagram for bar ABD. I show the applied force P and the support reactions at D. The normal force is shown perpendicular to the bar 
equal and opposite as shown on the wheel. The friction force must also be shown on the bar, in a direction equal and opposite of that shown on the wheel. Note that there is a condition of impending motion in the wheel. So the friction force is equal to the static friction force, mu sub s times n. Now let's look at a type of problem where we have impending motion at all contact points on a body. Here is the problem we looked at previously. With a rod supported at one end on a rough horizontal surface and the other end by a rough vertical surface. Suppose we want to find the minimum angle theta for the rod to remain stable. This type of problem is categorized as impending motion at all contact points because if point A slides then point B must also slide. Here's the free body diagram of the rod with the friction forces shown in the proper directions. There are five unknowns on this free body diagram the four forces shown, and the angle theta. We will analyze this bar as a rigid body. So we have three equilibrium equations, some forces x, some forces y, and some moments. We need two more equations. Since we are looking for the minimum angle theta, we have a condition of impending motion. That means our friction forces are both equal to the static friction force mu sub s times n. We will have an equation for friction at A and a separate equation for friction at B. This gives us a total of five equations to solve for our five unknowns. The last topic I want to focus on is overturning. Under the right conditions, an object supported on a rough surface and subjected to an applied force may overturn or tip over. We want to analyze if overturning is likely to occur. Here is the refrigerator I had as a kid. Suppose it rests on the rough ground and there is an applied force P located a distance D above the ground. The center of gravity where its resultant self-weight acts is located a distance H above the ground and centered horizontally. There is a friction force opposing the applied push. So far we have shown the normal force as a resultant force acting more or less directly below W. But in reality the normal force is actually a distributed load. And when force P is applied, the load is not uniformly distributed. This means that the location of the resultant normal force is moved horizontally to the right, acting at point O. When performing an overturning analysis, we analyze the object as a rigid body and not as a particle. We don't know the distance x offhand, but we can find it by summing moments to zero about point O, or any point really, to find x. If we find that the distance x is less than b, there is no overturning. If x is equal to b, then the object is on the verge of overturning. If x is greater than b, then it will overturn under the applied load. Sometimes we want to analyze an object to determine whether it will overturn or slide. These are two separate analyses. As just discussed, we analyze overturning by treating it as a rigid body. We find x and compare it to b. For sliding, we analyze it as a particle. We find the friction force F and compare it to the static friction force. If F is greater than the static friction force, then it will slide. If there is no overturning and F is less than or equal to the static friction force, then the object is stable and there is no motion.